Hello and welcome to the Study Legal English podcast. I'm your host Louise, and today I'm very pleased to share with you my interview with Rupert Haig. Hmm, Rupert Haig. That name sounds familiar. I'm sure it does. Probably you might have heard that name before because Rupert Haig is the author of one of the most famous or one of the most、uh, renowned legal English books. It's called Legal English, and I've got the fifth edition of this book. It's a very good reference book. It's great for both spoken and written English. So if you don't have it, do check it out. And、uh, it's actually now in its sixth edition. So. What else? What else do we know about Rupert? Well, he's a graduate of Cambridge University. He has got two master's degrees in law, and he is a solicitor, qualified solicitor in England and Wales. Now he used to do quite a lot of legal training. However, nowadays he does more of the editing side of things. He does lots of editing of legal documents. Proofreading legal services. He calls himself a lawyer linguist. So, if you're interested in finding out a bit more about Rupert, go over to his website. It's www.legalediting.com. So, what do we talk about in this interview? Well, in this interview, Rupert shares with us his five top difficulties that people have in legal English. He actually very generously gave us a free PDF download of his top ten、uh, legal difficulties or legal mistakes. So, listen to the end, and I'm going to give you that link to get that download. It's a very useful download for both legal English teachers because maybe you want to run a class on top legal mistakes, and you can use this document to help you build your lesson plan, or If you're a student, which I'm sure many of you are, then of course it's going to help you improve your legal writing and your legal English, even in your spoken form. So, do listen to the end for that download. I want to mention that in the interview we cover some quite advanced stuff, but don't worry if you're a beginner, it's okay. Don't panic. I try to listen throughout the interview as I'm interviewing Rupert. In fact, you'll notice I, my head's down quite a lot, and I'm making notes. I am listening to Rupert. I'm just making notes so that afterwards I try to give some helpful tips for beginners and also to review some of the points that Rupert made. So, hopefully, even if you're a beginner or an advanced listener, this episode should be useful for you. Now, before we listen to the interview, I've got just a couple more things to say. Firstly, if you're not a member yet of the Facebook community group, head over to Facebook and just search for Study Legal English Group, and you can join our learning community there. Also, if you are not following me on Instagram yet, do so. <laughs> you can find me at Legal Englisher. And finally, if you're a member of my website, head over to studylegalenglish.com, and you can find the download for this episode for this transcript. So, I think that's enough points that I needed to make. So let's listen to that interview. Hi, Rupert. Welcome to the show. Thank you very much, Louise. It's nice to be here. Good, lovely to have you. I know you as the the man who's written legal English. A lot of the listeners out there will know you as that man too. But just as we were chatting before be, before putting on the record button here, I asked Rupert listeners if if he had any hobbies, and I was very interested to find out he's got a great hobby. Rupert, what's your hobby? Songwriting. So I write kind of alt pop numbers. I've got a song project called The Empty Mirrors, and I've got an EP coming out. I love hearing what kind of you know hobbies people do because obviously we don't just do legal English. We're all humans, and we all <laughs> <laughs> other hobbies to keep us sane. Yeah, I mean, music is very much like legal English in a way. It's all about kind of correcting mistakes and trying to get it to run smoothly. 
So there's kind yeah. of a connection in a spurious sort of way. Do you think the listeners, it's a good way to, for them to improve their English listening to music? Probably not exclusively. You might need to, um, <laughs> you might need to do something else as well. Yeah. Maybe some sort of singer-songwriters, Bob Dylan or Leonard Cohen, mm-hmm. that might expand your vocabulary a bit. Mm-hmm. So let's get into the juicy content of the interview. My first question I ask um, a lot of my interviewees is, how did you get to where you are today? What's your background? Yeah, okay, sure. I mean, I, I started off studying English. I went to Cambridge University and studied English. And this was quite a long time ago now, back in 1992, I graduated. So I came out, came out with a degree in English, which in, in common with lots of arts graduates, I didn't really know what to do with that degree. So, so I studied law. And that was you know, quite interesting, it turned out to be you know, quite a good thing to do. And I qualified as a solicitor after a few years and practiced for a few years in the UK. And that was, that was good in the various law firms in South of England. And then sort of personal circumstances took me to Finland. And at that point, I didn't really, I didn't really see a future in practicing law as such anymore. So I thought, well, what, what can I do with my background in, in English language and in law? The first answer is, well, perhaps I just should study a bit more law. So I, I took a degree in like a master's degree in international law at Helsinki University, which is really, really good, really good fun, really interesting, like a really different perspective on law. Because when you're studying national law, it can be quite pedantic and quite narrow. International law is very much about politics and economics and, and social considerations and all sorts of you know, holistic concerns. So that was great. But it still didn't answer the question of what I was going to do. So, so I came out of that with another degree. And I thought, well, perhaps I could combine this by offering some sort of service whereby I would teach legal English. So using my English background and knowledge of the English language, plus my knowledge of uh, law, which has now been augmented by having international law as well. And so I, I started up this company initially with a Canadian colleague. And we, you know, we did that. We offered the legal English teaching. We offered editing. And at one point, we offered a bit of translation along with subcontractors. After a while, we stopped doing that because it was so much more about management of the subcontractors. It wasn't really in our control. But it was, it was kind of a good experience anyway. And I think after the end of the first year of, of teaching legal English, I got some clients together. And we were you know, going through the things that they found useful. And I was sort of learning what to offer the clients. And I had these notes over the summer. And I thought, had a bit of a dead period over the summer. And I thought, well, what can I do with these notes apart from you know, reuse them for teaching other clients. I thought, well, perhaps I could start writing a book on legal English. And so I thought, well, maybe I should just go and see if there are already some books on legal English. And I went to the the local bookshop, the biggest bookshop in Helsinki, and I had a look around. And I, I saw there were some books, but they were kind of either books for a quite basic level of English learning, or you had kind of professional legal legal drafting books, which are more available in the UK, so more for people that are already qualified lawyers so there wasn't something in the middle for people that you know had a good level of english perhaps weren't familiar with all the legal the legal terminology yet but were learning and so i thought i'd try and bridge that gap with my textbook legal english which turned out to be quite a good idea i found a publisher quite quite quickly and we're now on the sixth edition coming up so yeah that's me i'm still doing this i'm not teaching legal english anymore but i'm editing i work for myself mainly I'm also a freelancer for the European Central Bank. When I started freelancing for the European Central Bank, the legislation division, I started to think, well, I really need to know more about European law and fill in some of the gaps. I did a master's in European law at King's College London as well. And that was, that was also great because it gave me this really good overview of European law. Unfortunately, <laughs> the very day we got our results from that course, and I found that I passed, was also the day when we got the referendum results back in 2016, the, uh, that the UK was going to leave the European Union. So the time wasn't great, but it was kind of memorable, I suppose. Yeah. So that's me, yeah. That's who I am. Fantastic. I didn't realise that you worked doing services for the European, did you say the European Central Bank? Yeah, that's right. That's interesting, because, like, Europe... I mean, the institution of Europe kind of has its own legal English, doesn't it? English. Yeah, it does. I mean, there are certain there are certain terms, certain phrases, which are not that commonly encountered in a kind of purely English or purely American, perhaps, legal English context. But one of the words which is used an awful lot in the European context is modalities. 
I think it's something like the method of doing something along with all the surrounding circumstances which might affect the way in which you do it. So I can kind of see why they want to use this word because it covers all of that without having to say all of that. But it's a strange word that I've never really encountered. I never encountered it in legal practice in the UK, for example. And I haven't encountered it outside the European kind of uh, context. So it does have its own its own way of doing things. And some of it's to do with, you know, having having so many different countries involved and having to find a shared language, which is English perhaps, or it might also be French, but having a sort of shared frame of reference which everybody can can tap into, but yeah. which perhaps might not be the same as we might expect to use in an English, purely English or purely American or Australian, perhaps, or New Zealand context. So let's move on to really what, what we want to talk about today, which is these common mistakes that you find in legal writing. So we're going to talk about five today, hopefully. What's the first one, Rupert? I want to take articles and prepositions together. This is a particular problem in Finland because Finnish doesn't have either articles or prepositions. And so it's quite tricky for, for Finns to know whether to use the or a or an, or, or even worse with prepositions. I think with prepositions, you almost have two different systems going. You have the logic system, whereby you have a pen, it's on the table or it's under the table. You're taking it to the table, you're taking it away from the table. Those prepositions are, are quite logical. And you have the traditional, um, idea of a preposition showing time, position, place, method, quantity, purpose, or condition, so those things. But this is complicated then by having phrasal verbs and kind of habits of speech. So if you take, for example, a word like deal, <clears throat> and you can have deal by itself in certain situations, it can be a noun, you, you have a deal. But then if you want to make it into a verb, you're going to add a preposition. And it's going to be a different preposition for slightly different nuances of the word so you might deal on the stock exchange but you deal in shares on the stock exchange and then you might deal with difficult clients and then maybe after work you might play cards and deal out the cards so you have a basic word which then has a number of different permutations and which dictate which preposition you use and they're not necessarily logical there's no real way of telling whether it's deal on or deal with necessarily and this applies to a whole number of different prepositions and some of them are quite you know quite commonly used in in, in legal context so think about entering into a contract we enter into a contract we don't enter on a contract or enter to a contract but that may not be particularly evident to somebody who doesn't know that and you might not be able to get at it through the logical way of looking at, you know, is this time, position, place, method, quantity, purpose, or condition? You have to just know these things. When you're dealing with prepositions, you have to really look at it from both a logical and a phrasal verb perspective. And I found that interesting one today, in the market or on the market. <clears throat> so if you have, for example, the, the sentence, are you in the market for shares traded on the market? So what is the difference between in the market and on the market? In the market being ready to do deals with the shares, but on the market, they're available on the market, meaning in the market, but in an intangible market like the stock exchange. On the other hand, if you're in an actual market, which is like a place, a physical place, then you talk about being in the market. So it's fiendishly complicated when you break it down. As to articles, I think articles are a little bit easier because you, know, you have a lawyer, somebody who's unknown previously and then you might then start referring to that person as the lawyer when, when you've mentioned them once but then you do have these these slightly ambiguous situations where for example a particular word could have a tangible or intangible meaning so for example conflict is a good one we understand conflict in two different senses one is an actual conflict a war perhaps or a battle in which case you talk about a conflict between two nations, let's say. If you're talking legal terms, you very often talk about provisions that are in conflict with each other, that contradict each other. And then you'd say in the event of conflict between the two provisions. So you don't have an article, you're leaving the article out. And the reason why you're leaving it out is because it's an intangible conflict, not a tangible conflict. So I think that's where articles can also be quite tricky. I think that sums up our, our, first, uh, our first point. 
So you've given your first point on these common errors covering both articles and propositions. Thank you. So these things aren't easy. And you mentioned that in Finnish, you know, wow, they don't have articles or prepositions. Is that correct? No, no, articles no, or neither. Yeah. The same in quite a few languages. So you're quite right. These are, these are common problems for, for lawyers in many, many countries. You mentioned there about the, the prepositions. You've got the logical ones, you know, on the table. These are quite easy to get. I think yeah. listeners probably um, you're going to be okay with those. But then when we move into the legal English, we've even got <laughs> phrasal verbs. You've got your verb plus a preposition that you just need to learn. You mentioned entering into a contract. Yeah. The common one, listeners, make sure you're not saying entering with a contract, I don't know, something else. And also a similar one to that, parties to a contract. Yeah, yeah that's a very common one. Parties of a contract is a very commonly used one, but that doesn't work. You have to be party to a contract. Yes. And I think I'd probably be quite confident in saying that, well, if you write parties of a contract, it's not going to be a deal breaker. That's not probably not one of the prepositions which is going to cost you millions of pounds. However, this doesn't sound very good. There are prepositions where if you get them wrong, they will cost you. You know, they could potentially, if there's a conflict, the clause is ambiguous, it doesn't sound quite right and you've written the wrong preposition. Well, when it comes down to a court judgment, maybe you're going to be in trouble. So certainly pay attention to your prepositions. Yeah. For example, if I say the goods must be taken into the warehouse, you know they're inside. But if I say the goods must be taken to the warehouse, you're not sure if they're inside. They might just be outside, which might be fine, but then it, maybe it's going to rain. So they can also have a practical, hugely practical consequences if you get the wrong one. That's a great point. So, you know, a lot of listeners out there, they're dealing with contracts and so if you're drafting your contract and you're putting in, in your obligations, prepositions can really, really make a big difference. Going into the warehouse, mm. the goods are going to have to literally be taken inside or to the warehouse. Well, you're just going to drop them off outside and if yeah. it rains, well, tough. <laughs> and then with the articles, yep, you know, the general kind of thing that, non-native uh, English speakers learn when they're at school, you use this indefinite article when you haven't referred to something before, a lawyer, and then the definite article when you've already referred to it, the lawyer. But then you mentioned where you've got something tangible, so something but for listeners, if you're not sure what that is, and I know that this, even the concept of tangible and intangible can be different with different languages, but tangible means something you can touch, you can feel. Mm, concrete. Concrete, okay? So if you've got a conflict which is actually happening, you would use this article. Whereas if something's intangible, like hypothetical, not, not concrete, like in a contract when you might have a the governing law clause or what happens in conflict situations in in the event of a, a breach or a dispute here don't use the article the idea of in the event of conflict between two provisions mm. would be an example yes. when you don't need an article in fact you shouldn't have an article but if you have in the event of a conflict between two nations then you know it's a, mm. an actual war then you have the article it's so difficult to get yeah. your around. What I'd suggest to listeners is that, you know, with these kind of things, uh, it's really good to have a teacher to guide you through, to help you out with these, or to really start to observe when you're reading documents, to observe how these articles and prepositions are being used. This is real high level stuff. Articles and prepositions are one of them. They're the smallest words, but they're the most difficult things to get correct. So if you're just a beginner, and you're feeling very confused by this, don't worry, <clears throat> don't start here. <laughs> you know, we're gonna cover some other stuff which you'll probably be able to relate to more. But when you're a bit more advanced, dealing with your articles and prepositions is something which is gonna mark you out as a real advanced user of legal English. 
yeah, it's worth un- sort of underlining that point that this is really high level stuff. If you get this right, you're really you're you're 100 there more or less. So don't worry too much if you're, if you're having yeah. trouble. You know that's entirely unsurprising. Yeah. So the next point, this is I think we can cover this a bit more quickly. Capitalizations, capitalization of words. So you capitalize certain nouns in English, but only proper nouns, like for example, Milan or London or somebody's name or the name of a month, like January, February. Or slightly more subtly, when you have a name of a tendency or a, perhaps a, a philosoph- philosophical sort of train of thought which is based on somebody's name, then you still use the capital. So, for example, Marxism or Trumpism. <laughs> can you say tr- then you can say Trumpism if you think that's a philosophy. <laughs> then you still use the capital. In the legal sphere, you have also capitals for defined terms. So quite often, if you're reading a contract, you'll have a section near the beginning of the contract which specifies certain terms which are going to be used in a certain defined sense that might be slightly different from their ordinary sense throughout the contract or in, also in a law. And so here you might typically use the capitalization to, to indicate so that you can spot that that's a defined term, not just an ordinary usage of the term. But a problem can arise when you have the term used in its ordinary sense and in its defined sense. And this is where things sometimes go wrong. You have this overcapitalization that exists. So for example, if you say the company, a defined term with a capital C, shall have the same rights as any other company, but any other company is not a defined term here. It's just a, a descriptive noun. So you don't then capitalize the second company. And the mistake that often happens is the second company here will be capitalized as well. And that's not necessary. And I think there's a kind of tendency in English at the moment that seems to be growing more and more of capitalizing every noun, which is what happens in German. That's how uh, German is written. But, but in English, we haven't historically done that. So it looks a little bit odd and slightly wrong. So, you know, for example, the land registry, a specific body, that's a proper noun. You capitalize, <clears throat> meaning you have a capital L and a capital R. But a land registry system, is just describing the concept, then you wouldn't have a, a capitalization of the L and R. So I think that's all I need to say about that particular subject. Great. So you mentioned, you know, when you've got a defined term and you're using it in your contract or in legislation as a defined term with that specific meaning, you should capitalize. But then if you're referring to that very same word in a general sense, don't capitalize. It's not necessary, although it might not be the biggest mistake. I'm sure there must be case law on it because I can imagine it could cause, you know, it could actually change potentially the meaning of a clause. The one that you gave, the company shall have the same rights as any other company. If you put both of those as defined terms, you're basically not saying... You're not differentiating the two, are you? Yeah. it's, It's got the same rights as it has. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, which doesn't make sense. So basically, yeah. that would be an unenforceable clause, probably. So really, listeners, pay attention. Even if you know this rule, it's kind of one of those mistakes that even a native speaker would make, not just by not paying attention, just because you're a busy yeah. worker and you haven't got time to, yeah. to go through stuff. One caveat I might add to that is that it's not always the case that defined terms are capitalised. You know, for example, in in EU legislation, they don't capitalise defined terms. But if they are, then that's a reason to capitalise. Mm, I didn't know that. Yeah, um, if you look up a sort of directive, EU directive, you'll hopefully find they're not capitalised. <laughs> wow. Thank you for pointing that out. So let's move on. Yes, so uncountable nouns. Uncountable nouns are, this is kind of contentious because they're changing a lot. What I mean by uncountable nouns is, Nouns that you can't pluralize with putting an S on the end. And some of them are quite obvious, and you'll instinctively know that that's wrong. So if I say, for example, equipment, and then I say, I have some equipments, you'll be like, no, that doesn't sound right to me. So you can't pluralize them in that way. There's a small group of nouns you can't pluralize in that way. You have to find another way of saying it. You have to say, um, I have 10 pieces of equipment, for example. Or I have, in general, some equipment, meaning that you know, it might be three pieces or it might be 10 pieces, but I have anyway some, some unspecified equipment. 
In my book, I have a list of, of these uncountable nouns, and you can find them on the internet as well. If you just look up uncountable nouns, you can find them, and, and also a way, ex explanations of how you deal with them. So the two ways I've mentioned, you either find another word like piece or item, or you, you use a general word like sum, or a third way is to find a synonym. So if, for example, you are faced with baggage, for example, you can't really say baggages. Can you say baggages? I would say probably not. Don't think so. So then you'd say, I have three bags or three suitcases or something like that. So you can find another word. Where this gets very tricky is that there are certain words in legal use where words have both a countable and uncountable meaning. So uh, liability is probably the, the, the most common pitfall. So liability, the root meaning is the same, that something you have to do or something that you have an obligation to do, but it splits out in different ways. So for example, liability understood as a general enforceable legal responsibility is not usually pluralized. <clears throat> so for example, if you say, the company does not accept liability in respect of the claim being made against it. You would always have that in the singular form. You wouldn't say the company doesn't accept liabilities. But there are also situations um, where you use liabilities as a plural. So if you talk about liabilities on a balance sheet, you mean sums owed. <clears throat> so that's a very common example. Another one that comes to mind is a rather mundane example of paper. So if I put paper in the photocopier, which I did this morning, I probably wouldn't count the paper and I wouldn't say I put 30 papers in the photocopier. I could say I put 30 sheets of paper in the photocopier, so you can find another word to, to do that with. But if I want to say that I have written a paper in the sense of an academic article, then it becomes plural, it becomes pluralizable. So I can then say, I've written 30 papers on the subject of liability or something like that. So sometimes it depends on the way in which you're using the word, the sense which you want to convey as to whether you can pluralize a word or not. And then of course there's the contentious gray area. So for example, a word like litigation, is that pluralizable? Some people say yes, some people say no. I think in the US it's probably more common to pluralize litigation, litigations. In the UK I think it's a bit doubtful. Training, can you pluralize training? Some people say yes, trainings. I mean, I personally don't like trainings very much, but it's a growing thing. People are using that. So you have to also kind of be sensitive to the way in which language is changing, because there's an argument for saying this whole idea of having uncountable nouns is just an unnecessary complication, and we should just make everything, everything pluralizable by using, by putting S on the end, and they would make it all, all a lot simpler. And then of course, there's on the other hand, there's also words that appear to be plural, but are actually singular. So like news. So then you say the news is on. You don't mean that there are lots of different news on. You mean that there's one program showing the news. So that can you know, add another shade of complication. So I think that concludes my, uh -huh. my thoughts on that subject. Good. This is such a common mistake not using uncountables correctly or not being aware that a word is uncountable so for example if you've got equipment you would say pieces of equipment to try and make that plural you wouldn't say equipments or you could say some equipment you mentioned some of those things where you've got plural and non-plural words like liability and liabilities with slightly different meanings and yeah so important so really nice points there and you mentioned that you've got a list of these in your book so certainly listeners if you've got Rupert's book check out that list and if you don't have his book well go go out and buy it <laughs> <laughs> or look on the internet for a list you can find it <laughs> okay Rupert, Rupert's saying look, look on well, the internet for a list <laughs> mine's more focused at legal language so it's a bit more exactly yeah. exactly <clears throat> uh, get get straight to the the, the good stuff Good. Okay, moving on. What's the common error number four? Common error number four. I suppose we should talk about subject verb agreement, which is really a horrible, a horrible area. It's quite complicated, even for native uh, level writers or speakers of English. And this is when you use a plural with a singular verb, for example. So, for instance, 
if I say to you, my lawyer, along with my accountant and one of his colleagues, are expected to arrive later, that's wrong because you have to take the, the cue from my lawyer, which is singular. So later in the sentence, when you arrive at expected, you're still referring to my lawyer, even though you've got in between commas this, along with my accountant and one of his colleagues, sort of in between that. So you have to kind of follow the train of logic of your sentence and work out where your, it's typically is, you know, to be word, to what word that relates. And I think a typical mistake here is to, is to relate it immediately to the word that, that precedes it. And that might be right, but it also might be wrong. So you need to, to <clears throat> work your way back and see what you're referring to. Typical error, for example, again, the number of different companies involved are five. Because you think, oh, yeah, companies, that's plural, are. But that's not right because you're talking about a number. So a number is, even though that refers to the plural, it's expressed as a singular. So it's quite, it's quite nasty, quite complicated. One of the key errors is when you're dealing with an and or an or. So as a rule of thumb, if it's and, then it's going to be plural. If you're using an and, my lawyer and my accountant are here today. That's going to be plural. That's all right. <clears throat> but my lawyer or my accountant will be here today. Okay, it's one or the other. So it's a singular is here today what else can we say yes what we just said about the news comes into this as well if you've got a noun which appears to be plural but it is in fact singular of which there is a, not that many but news is one maths is another you must remember to use the singular form and then you also you can't pluralize them anyway you'd have to pluralize them with another word if you have a word that has in it each everyone everybody anyone someone, somebody, all of those obviously singular will require singular forms. So each of the candidates is capable of doing the job well, not each of the candidates are capable of doing the job well. You have to remember that each of those words, those words, each, everyone, etc., refer to a, a singular form. Also you have phrases which appear to be plural. So if I say five years is a long time to wait for a court hearing, you might think five years, yes, that's plural, but you're not referring to that as an plural sense, you're referring to it as a, a period of time, as a singular. So it's five years is. This area is really, is really tricky, and it's easy to make mistakes by not, just by not reading through what you're, you've, you've written very carefully. And I think it's, it's something that is very commonly, it makes, it's mistakes are very commonly made also by native speakers. So there's no substitute really for just... Um, knowing the general principles, but then reading carefully to see which noun your verb actually relates to. And perhaps another, another sort of lesson from this is don't write excessively long sentences if you can avoid it. You can't always avoid it in law because sometimes law depends on having these linking clauses and you can't really split them up very easily. But if you can avoid it, a simple sentence that's short and only has one main proposition will sort of avoid you having to make these multiple linkages and use these complicated um, constructions yes i mean this is really really advanced stuff and it's some of the things that you mentioned there i believe listeners with a with a lower level will be able to grasp for example you know that simple rule of if you've got my lawyer and his colleague are visiting compared to my lawyer or his colleague is coming today mm. The rule being, if you've got an and, then generally you're, you're turning that into a group of people and so you should use are, but if you're using or, then it's still singular and you should be using is. Then some of the more complicated things that you mentioned there, you mentioned about this, if you've got something between commas, for example, or between yeah. parentheses, that can be a little bit confusing because... I think you mentioned my lawyer, along with his colleagues, colleagues. is expected to arrive today. So if you have along yeah. with his colleagues in, in commas, the logic of that is that breaks up the, the flow of the sentence and what's in between commas is not part of the original proposition. So you're still talking just about my lawyer. Yeah. And so therefore you have ears. And that, you know, this, is, this sort of illustrates exactly why this is such a complicated and difficult area which people make mistakes in because... In speech, you, you wouldn't really worry about this. It's only when it's written down that it can be problematic. 
because then you're thinking, yes. well, who, who's who's doing what exactly? It's really <clears throat> complicated stuff. If you've got my lawyer, comma, along with his <laughs> colleagues, comma, yeah. uh, is expected, not are expected, because it's as though you're putting that along with his colleagues. <laughs> in parenthesis it's just yeah. an additional little extra bit of information you could take it out the real thing that you're referring to there is my lawyer and so for these types of uh subject verb agreement you know look some examples up online learn the rules check out rupert's book for some further further information about it but then also you know pay attention to what we've said today so, next point, your fifth, your fifth and final yeah, point. Fifth and final. <clears throat> so I think we could perhaps end with um, you know the issue of sexist language, which is is really about two things. It's usually about avoiding he or him, but it's also about avoiding uh, she or her in situations where you're talking about a hypothetical person. So you don't want to assume that it must be one gender or the other, and your language has to reflect that. So that's one side of it. And the other side of it is that there are certain kind of words that are embedded in, in English language which have man in them. So they're kind of making an assumption about, you know, the gender identity of the person fulfilling that function. A fireman, for example, draftsman, etc. In those situations, you, you can either just use the equivalent with woman. You could say firewoman. That doesn't sound quite, <laughs> quite right. Draftswoman doesn't sound quite right either. Or you could find a neutral way of doing it. So license or mortgage or sort of legal terms so so hence drafter would be possible if you don't want to say draftsman you can say drafter mm. so on the terminology side of things it's fairly straightforward you find a a gender neutral equivalent chairman was one you can say chairwoman but you can also say chair nowadays so you can be a chair and you can chair a meeting but then you have the, the situations where you might have a he or a, a him or possibly a she or a her. And you're thinking, well, I'm talking about a hypothetical person here. I don't want to assume that they are necessarily going to be a, a man or necessarily going to be a woman. How do I get around this? And there are certain, certain sort of techniques you can use. For example, you can, instead of using the personal pronoun he, him, for instance, you could use an article. So you, instead of saying the lawyer and his client, you could say the lawyer and the client or a lawyer and a client. Or you could pluralize because plurals don't have gender. So you could then say lawyers and their clients, <clears throat> because here we're, you know, we're talking about hypothetical people. So it doesn't really matter if they're plural or, or singular um, when they're not actual people. Or you can use the infinitive form. That often works quite well. So. If you say, for example, a lawyer may agree that he will draft a contract, you'd think, oh, no, 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 wait a minute, that, why should a lawyer be a, a male? So you might then say, well, how about a lawyer may agree to draft a contract? So instead of he will draft a contract, you've got the infinitive form to draft a contract, and that gets around the problem. Another good possibility, if you use who, so we have also these kind of relative pronouns. So who, whom, which, and that, of which who and whom refer to people. So in some situations, we can use those as a, a way of getting around using he, or, he or, or him. And so if you had something like, if he does not pay attention to detail, a finance option is worse than useless. And then you might think, well, why should this uselessness be limited to, to this male finance officer? Uh, or its potential uselessness, you could think, well, perhaps I'll use who instead of he. So you could say the finance officer who does not pay attention to detail is worse than useless. So you're replacing the he with who there. If all else fails, of course, you can simply repeat the noun because, of course, he or she or him and her are pronouns. They replace nouns. So <clears throat> you can just use the noun again. So you could, for example, say, when considering the negotiations, the delegate should retain an objective view, and in particular, he should not do such and such. Then you might think, oh, wait a minute, the delegate might be a woman as well. So how do I get around that? Well, perhaps I could just say the delegate again, 
I can say when considering the negotiations, the, de the delegate should retain an objective view. In particular, the delegate should, it's perhaps not the most elegant way to phrase the sentence, but it's better than making this sexist assumption. Because why do we have to assume the gender of this hypothetical person? And then, of course, you can combine all these different techniques. So you can use them together. You don't have to just pick one and stick to it. You can stand back from the sentence that you're trying to change and apply any of those techniques. Sometimes it might be completely unnecessary to even mention the gender. So, for example, if you have the officer must read the documents as soon as they're delivered to him, you might think, well, do I need to say to him at all? Why don't I just say just delivered? I don't need to um, go into that sort of detail. So I think in almost all cases, you can find a way of avoiding making sexist assumptions in your writing just by using a bit of dexterity uh, and a bit of flexibility, and particularly using those techniques that I've mentioned, which I've listed in my book. And I think you can also find them online as well. I think this is worth doing because I think there was a period where, where this wasn't taken particularly seriously and people were saying, well, when I, of course, when I mean, when I say man, you know, I mean, it could be a woman as well. But if it still exists in the language, there must be some kind of implication going on here. So it's best if you can, if you possibly can, to get rid of all of these, these implications and just have really neutral, clear language. It's very often the case, actually, that, that those techniques actually help with other things as well. They might make the text less ambiguous um, and clearer <clears throat> because it forces you to pay attention to what you're writing. Yeah, it's one of those controversial topics, I guess, and also something which is quite current, this uh, idea to remove sexist language. I think the problem with it, with English is that we have these, you know, we have gender pronouns, whereas in yeah. other, yeah. other yeah, languages, fact, they don't have them. Yeah. In Finnish, there aren't any gender pronouns. There's, there's han, which is, you know, it's, it's, it covers both male and female. So this problem doesn't arise with personal pronouns at all. Yeah. In Latin languages, it's the noun that takes the gender rather than the, the person. So, for example, yeah. say his book, you'd say, like, il suo libro, or even if it was a lady, the book is masculine, therefore doesn't matter the gender of the person. So this can be a bit confusing for people whose native languages don't have gender pronouns, and then they might think, well, what's the problem? I, I suppose... First of all, we're only talking about when you don't know the gender of the person. If you don't know, then, you know, making an assumption sometimes that, oh, it's going to be a man could potentially be offensive. However, it, it depends what you're writing for. For example, if you're writing a contract, how do you feel, Rupert, about using less words rather than putting he or she all the way throughout the contract, simply putting in a defined term as is quite often the case and saying, you know, whenever he is referred to, this also means... She. Yeah, yeah, I mean, you can, you can do that. And you can also do the sort of he slash she or the S in brackets, H-E techniques. All of those techniques are perfectly valid. And it will come down to things like, you know, this is how we do it in a certain firm or our house style and so on. So, yeah, that's perfectly valid. I think it's probably better suited for contracts. If I was writing a more free-flowing text, I don't think you want to have too many defined terms or brackets or it's, it's sort of something you associate with with very formal documents yes yeah of course most legal documents are very formal so, yeah. so that's maybe not such a problem it will be interesting to see how this how the language develops in the future because you know i just feel like god why don't we just use it <laughs> and that's another important point for listeners is that sometimes people from latin languages where the noun takes the gender then they use a gender pronoun for that. For example, the client should send, the company should send her or him the document, as in they use her or him to refer to the company, <clears throat> which you know is obviously incorrect because our nouns don't take a gender. Anyway, we'll see how that develops. It's an important point to mention, and especially those words that are, are developing, like, you know, businessman, you can say businesswoman, chairman, chairwoman. You can go sideways as well. You can have business executive, for example, or entrepreneur, mm. or 
there's another word I can't quite bring to mind that describes mm. a person of either gender who is involved in business. Business <laughs> professional. Yeah. Yes. Very nice. And so as we were going through there, I was busy taking notes Rupert I did think of a point for going back to the articles for beginners that's a really difficult thing to get your head around but there's perhaps an one thing I wanted to ask you about which probably beginners can relate to in a contract sometimes you see the buyer mm. the seller yeah. so you just see buyer seller do you think it really makes a difference? Do you advise about one of them or the other? No, <laughs> I don't think it makes a difference. I think it again comes down to to company style. I think some companies prefer to just say company or buyer or seller and not have the, because I suppose you could say it's one less thing to worry about. Yeah, yeah. that's a great point. And that can be confusing for listeners because a listener might read a contract here that says, the buyer, the seller, then they read another contract that says buyer, seller, without any articles, and then they're confused and they don't know which one's correct. Rupert says, don't worry about it, it doesn't matter. Just choose your style, whichever one you prefer, and then use it consistently. But that's a nice point that the, the beginners can take away. So, thank you, Rupert. It's been a real pleasure to have you on the show. You're welcome. And thank you, listeners. Great. So that's the end of today's episode. I hope you found it useful. I hope you learned something new. Don't forget that you can certainly head over to my website and get that free PDF download of Rupert's top 10 legal English mistakes. Just go to studylegalenglish.com forward slash episode 103. And if you're interested in connecting with Rupert, you can do so. Find him on LinkedIn. Just search for Rupert Haig. So search for him on LinkedIn and of course, check out his website, www.legalediting.com. So thanks for listening and see you next time.